Yesterday, here at St. Mary's, we celebrated the very joyful occasion <coughs> of a wedding, which is why we have these fancy candles out today. And in my words to the couple, I began telling them about a friend of mine that I recently visited who was struggling with anxiety over the state of the world. And who asked me, what do you tell your congregation when faced with all the evil that we see in the world today in times like these? And so I told her what I thought I should say to you in case I haven't said it yet. So, uh, and now I'm going to tell you what I told you. So I got around to it eventually. And so this is what I said. I said, stop watching TV. Get off the computer. Go outside. Walk around your neighborhood. Talk to real people face to face. Ask them about their lives and how things are going. What you will find if you do this is that people aren't as bad as you might think they are. They are actually probably much more decent in person than they might present themselves online or uh, in mass, right? They're not as bad as they have been ginned up to be. In fact, at this time in human history, and I made this point to uh, both her and to the couple yesterday, we are living at the safest, healthiest, most prosperous, most technologically advanced time in human history ever. It doesn't mean there's not problems. It doesn't mean that there are not terrible things that are happening in the world. There still are. But when it comes down to it, globally speaking, this is a better time to be alive as a human being than it has ever been in the history of humanity and even the prehistory for that matter. It's an incredible time to be alive. And yet, we kind of forget this. We get so wrapped up in the drama of the moment. And while we can and should make every effort that we can for more and more people to share in that safety and health and well-being and prosperity, we should not overwhelm ourselves with guilt or shame about having these blessings, but we should rather give thanks to God for them and commend ourselves and our whole life unto Christ. In this way, we can fully experience joy without having to constantly close our hearts up out of a sense of anxiety or shame. For we as a civilization, not just individuals, but whole nations, are at the point where we are being faced with a, a, a conundrum. We can gain the whole world, as the Gospel says, yet we might lose our soul in the process. It's a lot easier for humanity when times are tough, actually. We're a lot better when our back is up against the wall. The best comes out of us when hard things are going on. It's when things are really good that we kind of fall apart. And so we need to learn how to live within this context of blessing and not turn it into a curse. Now, St. Paul exemplifies this attitude, this approach, actually, when you look at our reading today from 2 Corinthians 6. He was facing tribulations, but he was also facing extraordinary success in his ministry. In spite of everything he went through, he was neither embittered nor fluffed up, so to speak. He suffered much for the gospel, yet he saw incredible fruits of that struggle. And the key thing is that he did not claim credit for it. But he gave thanks to everyone, especially the Lord, for everything that he experienced. And so he could say that he was one who was as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. It's such a beautiful image. Now lately I've been appreciating the work of social researcher Brene Brown, you may have heard of her, uh, whose main work has been on the area of vulnerability and shame. And uh, I'll probably be talking about those subjects in future sermons 
Uh, these are topics which we desperately need to understand better as a culture and also as a church so that we can move forward and do the best that we can. And I've been posting some of her talks on my Facebook so when you're done walking around the neighborhood and talking to your people and you get back online, you can check that out if you like. Uh, but today I want to share a little bit with you from her work that she had done, research she had done on the question of joy and gratitude. She studied and found that one of the greatest antidotes that we have to the pain and suffering, um, often self-inflicted, of, of shame in our lives is through gratitude. In her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, she writes about three points that came through in her research with interviews that she had done extensively with people that were joyful. This is what she says. She says, without exception, every person I interviewed who described living a joyful life or who described themselves as joyful actively practiced gratitude and attributed their joyfulness to their gratitude practice. Two, both joy and gratitude were described as spiritual practices that were bound to a belief in human interconnectedness, human interconnectedness and a power greater than us. And three people were quick to point out the difference between happiness and joy as the difference between a human emotion that's connected to circumstances and a spiritual way of engaging with the world that's connected to practicing gratitude. In another talk, she puts it this way. She says, people who are able to lean into joy in their lives, who really get the most out of it and really deeply experience joy. Share the common trait of practicing gratitude. She makes the point that we're used to the phrase attitude of gratitude, and I and I preached that before, of course. Uh, but it's really not about the attitude. Attitude is a symptom of good practice. The practice of gratitude, the actions, the verbs of gratitude are what the keys were. And it's really a sign of, uh, of our difficulty as a culture that we even need to explain this, isn't it? That we actually have to stop and kind of think and try to imagine what does that even mean to practice gratitude. Uh, we're, we're, we're so used to the things that we don't have to explain, like blaming others, being disappointed, being upset, being frustrated, being anxious, you know, that, that you don't need, need to explain the practice of those things. We, have, we all have those down pat, right? Brown says, what does a gratitude practice look like? The folks I interviewed talked about keeping gratitude journals, doing daily gratitude meditations or prayers, creating gratitude art, and even stopping during their stressful, busy days to actually say these words out loud, I am grateful for dot, dot, dot. When the wholehearted talk about gratitude, there are a whole bunch of verbs involved. It seems that gratitude without practice may be a little like faith without words. It's not a lot. Does this sound a little bit familiar? Do we not hear these same kind of concepts and words in, in the epistle reading today that we heard? The readings from St. Paul and so forth? And a lot of these things that she's describing are in another kind of packaging, everyday orthodox practices or Christian practices that we should be doing. We're called to live as Eucharistic people. That means the people who give thanks. And we do that today here, our divine liturgy. We're coming here, hopefully, to come give God thanks. That's what we do here every Sunday. If you're wondering, why did I come here today? Why do, I, why do I keep coming here? And the next question is, what am I getting out of it? Then you're asking the wrong question. The question should be, what was I here to give thanks for? What do I need to remember that God has done for me that I now am offering back to Him due honor and praise? That's what we do. And all these practices throughout the day she describes are perfectly uh, excellent. Examples. All of these icons, by the way, were, were expressions of gratitude. Everybody who donated to this project 
They did it out of thanks to God for the people that these icons represented in their lives. For their family members, their, their patron saints, whose intercessions they appreciated. All of these icons, all these saints that you see are up there for a reason. And it has to do with people expressing gratitude. Everything we're doing in the church every single day has to do with this. But as I said, many of us are practicing something other than gratitude on a regular break basis and we're really well practiced at it. Do you ever find yourself rehearsing tragedy? Running through your mind the next terrible thing that's about to happen? Expecting the worst? Never allowing yourself to fully enjoy the blessings that you've been given? Enjoying the moment that you're in with the people that you love because you're waiting for the other shoe to drop? How many of us spend years in that state? Instead of finding the silver lining in today's clouds, we're actually focused completely on the storm clouds on the horizon, whether they get here or not, like Hurricane Florence who passed us by. And these habits are practices. They really are. Sometimes they're rooted in deep insecurity. For some reason, we don't trust others. We don't trust the world. We don't even trust God to open ourselves to the gifts that we've been given. Maybe we don't trust ourselves because we think there's something wrong with us. And so therefore, sometimes it's also shame. We believe deep down that we're truly bad people, that we're unworthy of the blessings we've received, and therefore we shouldn't have them. And we're just waiting for the time that, you know, God or karma or justice or whatever you want to call it finally catches up to us and we get our proper comeuppance punishment for it. It's only a matter of time before the bottom falls out. How many of us have spent years of our lives in that kind of space, mentally and spiritually? And worst of all, sometimes this kind of thinking is wrapped up and dressed in Christian language in order to justify it, you know, religiously. That there's some kind of piety in this type of shame and negativity. This may be the greatest affront of all. This is not Eucharistic thinking. The Gospel teaches us to practice gratitude, enjoy, and to eschew negative, faithless thinking, because that's what it really is. Because yes, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Christ has overcome the world. Yes, these good things aren't going to last. And even our lives are going to come to an end. Yes, bad things happen even to good people. But the good news is that that's not the end of the story. The good news is that God is not like us. He doesn't sit there and berate us and blame us and punish us the way we punish ourselves. When we move away from Him, he doesn't say, fine, to heck with you. We don't need you anyway, like so many of us are willing to do. He comes after us. He chases us down. He came all the way down from heaven down to earth, laid in a manger, walked around, hungry and sweaty and thirsty, healed a lot of hungry and thirsty and sweaty people, suffered a lot of insults and persecution, and climbed all the way up that hill to be laid on a cross for us. This cross that we're commemorating, venerating, giving thanks for this weekend. So while we continue to punish ourselves, God forgives us. We have done evil. And sometimes we are bad. But we're still His children. We still have that image of God within us even if we've obscured the likeness. And though this life ends, and yes, all the good things in it, He has prepared for us a new life in the enjoyment of eternal blessings. This is what we pray, especially in baptisms. We have that wonderful prayer. May they see the good things of Jerusalem all the days of their life. What a beautiful image. How can we not be a grateful people 
We may even have to be crucified with Christ at some point in our lives. But like St. Paul, we'll be able to say, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Brothers and sisters, this is our practice of gratitude, to say this, to express it, to sing it as we do throughout the liturgies. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us give thanks to them. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us lay aside all earthly cares that we may receive the King of all. Let us practice his righteousness all through the day. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Christ is among us. God bless you.